Hey everyone, welcome to the lecture, Newborn and Infant Development, Foundations for Childhood Occupations. My name is Melissa Kay, and this is Development Through the Lifespan, Occupational Therapy 212. Let's get started. We have four objectives for today. First, to describe the developmental tasks of the neonate. Then, to discuss the impact of a baby on the family. Third, to list developmental tasks and behavioral milestones of infancy. And last, to summarize the importance of the developmental sequence. When we think about uh, newborn and infant development, we first need to define what infancy exactly means. In a general way, infancy is the period between birth and 12 months. During this time, uh, it's divided into a couple uh, smaller areas, and the neonatal period is the first of those. It's the first four weeks after birth, and during that time, there's transitions in all domains of function. Think about it. It's the time when the baby goes from being in utero to out in the bigger world. And so, of course, everything about that child's life changes dramatically with the advent of birth. During this period of infancy, there's significant uh, environmental mastery across all behavioral domains, and the processes that underlie this change are both intrinsic and extrinsic. And what that means is that uh, intrinsic changes are more uh, arising from physiological changes in the child, and extrinsic changes arise from the impact of the caregivers and the environment on that infant. The first year of life, or infancy, is divided into four basic periods. We have early infancy, which is birth through three months, and that neonatal period happens during that first three months, of course. Then middle infancy, which is four to six months. Late infancy, seven to nine months. And finally, a transition period from infancy to toddlerhood that happens at 10 to 12 months. We might ask ourselves, what kind of occupations can infants engage in, right? They're just babies. Uh, when we think about it, we want to think about um, scaling down occupation to its very most basic kinds of activities and tasks. So for example, the baby does engage in play, which is its major form of education. Uh, the child is motivated to learn about the environment from reaching out and interacting with the environment in a form that we call play. There's also self-care activities, and they mostly have to do with kind of quote-unquote infant tools, which include crying, smiling, looking super cute, and uh, that feeds self-care by enabling the infant to reach out into the larger world to get what they need, and they're not yet able to motorically get on their own. We also think about rest and sleep as an occupation of an infant, and during this first year, the cycles and rhythms of waking and sleeping, and also calm and uh, alert states, start and, uh, and become ingrained and become uh, patterns and habits for the infant. There's also a social emotional component. And again, the infant doesn't have a lot of tools yet. And so intense eye contact, smiling, crying, startling at loud noises, and cuddling are some of the ways that an infant engaged, engages in social emotional um, occupation. And finally, it's important to think about the infant in conjunction with his or her caregiver. What I mean by that is because a Again, the infant doesn't have a lot of ability to move or to exert um, impact on the environment themselves, especially when they're at the very young infancy phases. They will um, engage in occupation along with their caregiver. So when we think about babies, we think about this, uh, this idea or concept of co-occupation. 
All right, so what do the theorists say about infancy? You know, any time we consider development, we want to check in and we want to see what do developmental theorists contribute to this phase. It's, it's kind of like a variety of perspectives that we can use to think about the age or phase of development. First, we have Erickson, who is involved in psychosocial development, and the period of 0 to 12 or 18 months, somewhere in there, is characterized by um, the phase of basic trust versus basic mistrust. And it has to do with attachment, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, but think about um, the infant forming a loving, solid, trusting relationship with their caregiver or caregivers. And so they either um, move through this initial period of development with an attitude of trust and security, or conversely, and which unfortunately happens with some infants, they have an attitude of basic mistrust, which will accompany them throughout their childhood and, in fact, um, for many people throughout their lives. The other theorist we want to think about is Piaget. And Piaget uh, is linked with cognitive development. And what he did was he observed his own children to see what they were doing. And then he developed these four stages of development. For the infant, they are in the sensory motor phase of development, which happens between zero and two years of age. So sensory motor developmental phase uh, is based on information that's obtained through the senses and also through body movement. And, um, and the child is gaining information about the world and they're developing their brain and their thinking power through their senses and through their ability to reach out into the world and, um, and touch objects, manipulate objects, and explore. During the first year, um, according to Piaget and what we see in observing infants, object permanence is developed. So that's one key part of this sensory motor phase. And object permanence is that if I hide an object, say uh, I put a rattle underneath a dish towel, um, the baby still knows it's there and they will look for it. The hidden object still exists. And peekaboo is a game that, um, that pulls upon this, right? So I cover my eyes and go peekaboo and the baby knows that I'm there. It was kind of a lame peekaboo. Um, the baby knows that I'm there and so they are um, they are just thrilled with to find that yes in fact even though they can't see me or see the object it's there and that is a phase of cognitive development. The other um, piece that Piaget talks about is goal-directed actions. And uh, that has to do with the baby planning something, like um, batting their hand at a swinging toy. Well, they're planning, this, uh, they're planning this motoric action, and then there's a goal, and the goal in this case, if they're um, batting a swinging toy, is that they actually hit the toy, right? And then the toy goes swinging, and so they are learning that they have an effect on their world. Those are the two theorists that we're going to focus on for this period of infant development. And as we move through the lifespan and the different phases, we'll look at different aspects of theory. So as we start our exploration of the newborn and the infant, it's really important to keep in mind that childbirth and the sudden uh, the sudden presence of a baby introduces a huge amount of change into a family's life and a family's functioning and the occupations of everyone who belongs to that family. Uh, a baby being born is irrevocable, so once they're there, they're not going away. Uh, there's a challenge for newborns to adapt in this new environment and everyone else to adapt to the presence of a baby. And the family is challenged to kind of recalibrate what sort of habits, roles, routines, rituals they have going on in their family. Uh, one example is 
a, a change in rest and sleep, of course, right? Because a baby will eat many, many times during the day and the night. They'll be up and down during the day and the night, and that's going to change everything around the family. Okay, so caregivers and the developmental sequence. We know that caregiving practices can affect patterns of development. So if you think about nature nurture, this is the nurture part of things. When there's um, some examples of that is when there's an early emphasis on independence, right? So some families value independence, some families value interdependence. In other words, uh, the adults and the children working together to um, to complete tasks. Um, we have uh, we have differences in in how a child is raised and the patterns of development given that relationship. There's also um, the role of older siblings, if they're going to be caregivers, and views on sleep and feeding. Do we put the baby down and let it cry itself to sleep? Do we pick the baby up? Do we keep the baby in bed with us? Do we make, the, uh, make sure that the baby is in a crib, right? So there's all different attitudes about parenting and about um, caregiving that influences patterns of development. The other piece is that attachment, which is this deep emotional bond that forms between a baby and the person who is most um, providing most of their care. And for some children, that is a variety of people. Um, but it's this bond that builds within the first year and, um, and kind of forms the foundation for how secure and how solid uh, emotionally and on a very deep level a child is throughout their childhood and even into adulthood. The person that we associate with this, and we're not going to approach um, uh, the theory right now, but uh, her name is Mary Ainsworth, and in 1970 she identified some different styles of attachment, and she did this through observing children and looking at their responses and then comparing that with how, uh, how their parents were and what sort of social circumstances they were um, being reared under. So she identified uh, three main attachment styles and then a fourth was added later in 1990. So uh, secure attachment, insecure avoidant, insecure ambivalent or resistant, and then um, the fourth was identified as disorganized. And uh, here is an example of, you can see on the left side, um, different kinds of behavior. And then at the top, the, the three of the four different types of attachment and what that brings out or what sort of behavior that brings out in a child. So I'm going to let you go through that on your own. But suffice to say that a variety of different uh, kinds of circumstances can produce attachment um, that is not secure. So we're after secure attachment. You can see that 70% of infants have secure attachment. Um, an experience or uh, uh, um, example from my life is that I have uh, um, my best friend adopted two uh, girls from Ethiopia when they were in their infancy. They were six months of age and one of them had been um, with her mom for a couple weeks and then given up for adoption and the orphanage that she wound up in actually had um, enough caregivers so that she got some personal attention and bonded with the caregivers even in the orphanage. The other daughter um, was abandoned very shortly after birth, so never bonded in the slightest way with her birth mom, and then did not receive the same level of caregiving and attention and just human contact that, um, that the other child did. And so as a result, um, they developed very, very different methods of coping. The little girl who um, did not receive any, um, any uh, care from her mom, when she was a baby, she would let anybody pick her up. She would go to anyone. She would, um, uh, she would just kind of engage 
uh, without any discernment. And for little kids, that's actually not typical. Um, the other little girl, in contrast, was very attached and became very attached to her mom, my friend, um, quite quickly. And so as they are now going into um, girlhood and now adolescence, because it's been quite a while, they demonstrate really different patterns of personality, temperament, and coping. So um, attachment is very, very important, and it happens at a super young age.